Welcome to the Rockonomics Podcast, episode number 42. I am your host, Dill, and today we have a revealing conversation with singer Chris Shin. Chris is probably best known for playing in the band's Unified Theory with Brad Smith and Christopher Thorne of Blind Melon and ex pearl Jam drummer Dave Cruzen, and for replacing Ed Kowalsik in the band Live from 2012 to 2016. He's been chipping away at the music business since the mid-90s and has some great anecdotes to share about the highs and lows of his journey. Chris was kind enough to invite me to his home studio on a beautiful fall day, and our hour-plus conversation went a little something like this. This is a random question. Yeah. I was wondering, around 2002 through like 2005, what was going on? You know, in the atmosphere was American Idol, and then yeah, a few years yeah. later, uh, Rockstar in Excess. Mm-hmm. So these reality shows that were, you know, you know, talent shows, yeah. more or less. And there seems to be holes in the in, in those years in what you were doing. So you're either yeah. developing something, or I was just curious: were you ever pursued to pursue one of those shows? Well, as a matter of fact, I was. It's funny that you mentioned the NXS thing. I one of the producers had called me about maybe doing the show and I didn't I didn't want to do you it. He said no. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious. There, you know, that was right after Unified Theory cuz Unified Theory ended at like 2001. So after that was sort of I put together a band um, everything is energy but you know, we 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 spent years kind of playing gigs and trying to make a record. We finally did. I'm still very proud of that. We had a guy that worked for us that um, really screwed us in the end. He had he had taken all the money for the tour support, like all the money that I got to invest in the whole band and everything, he started opening accounts under his name as opposed to, you know, so when, when he left, he left with all, all of our everything. Right. E- even when we had the record on iTunes, he took it down. Like, uh, it's, it's, this is all going to go lead up to why the stuff with live has really hurt me, you know, because it's, it's like a second, like it's happened to me before in other ways, but but, but yeah, we did the everything. Everything is energy thing, and that went through a different couple band name titles. And but the NSX thing, yeah, I turned that down. I didn't want to. I just wasn't interested right. at all. I was curious at because I did, I guess I didn't realize it at the time when that show was going on that they were. It seemed like the show of like people walking off the street or getting in line and getting a shot. But I, yeah. I'd heard later like yeah. even with Idol, like behind the scenes, they're trying to push. You know, mm-hmm. they're people are angling to get in there and get yeah. their artists in there and uh-huh. everything. So. I've been that guy though for a, like a long time. It's you know I've had people come to me with from the DeLeo brothers years and years ago, and before they did the thing with Richard Patrick, mm-hmm. uh, the talk show is that what it was yep. called? Uh, that? I, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And it's funny. Richard and I are, are good buddies now. Live toured with Filter, and Richard and I hit it off real well. Actually, I, I texted him just the other day about you know he's about to put out a new record. And was as filter, mm-hmm. and uh, I I was just picking his brain about maybe doing some shows together, and he really loved the idea. Oh, that's cool. He thought that'd be great. So there's you know I'm sort of feeling it out. I'm not. I haven't committed any. There's no big plan necessarily yet. As mm-hmm. far as that goes, we'll get to that. Though. Have you you just raised one of my last questions about you know other bands like STP? What about like a Velvet Revolver or any other well known you know slots uh, that were no. you know. Um, I worked for a while with Wes Borland mm-hmm. from Limp Biscuit, and he he put together a band. Uh, at the time, it was called Eat the Day, and it was him and his brother and uh, an old friend of theirs I grew up with on drums, and it was a really interesting band, and we were all set to make a record. And then they brought in Bob Ezrin to produce. Oh, cool. And he's a legendary guy. Yeah. He's, he's also got a reputation for being a bit of an asshole. Um I mean, you know, from everyone from Perry Farrell to Chino, Deftones have legendarily, you know, hated his guts, you know. But he gets great, he makes great records. You right. can't argue with it. But he came in and really just completely just blew the whole band apart. He he had this real, I did not like him at all. And I, I, I like everybody. I don't, right. <laughs> it takes a lot to rub me the wrong way. But he, he would talk about me as if I wasn't sitting right where you are. It was the most rude, unbelievable power play I'd ever seen in my life. And I just, I just... I could tolerate a lot of stuff, but that to me was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, and it and it just he got into Wes's ear, and then it just ruined the whole band, broke the whole band up, and it took almost a year later. Wes eventually would write me and and totally apologize. He go, "Man, Bob, Bob ruined that band," and he's like, "I'm really sorry for how I handled it because 
I was listening to Bob because I thought he had my best interests in mind. And he goes, I look back on it now and I can't believe I, I let him just completely dismantle everything that we had done. Well, it's funny, I mean, given the name Rockonomics, you, I, it sounds like you really have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of stories of oh, yeah. <laughs> what to do and what not to do. Or, yeah, you know, <laughs> no doubt, no you, doubt. You've been on the slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, without going too far back, let's let's work our way up to present day. But what, where were you? Ra- were you raised in Charlotte? Or were you raised in Charlotte? I was born in Raleigh, but I've I've lived here since I was probably five or something. Okay. And as you mentioned, you you got into bands relatively early. Yeah, what was yeah. what was the impetus that got you? I never had any musical. Uh, there was no music in the family. My grandfather was a was a big band trumpet player. Uh, he passed away though when I was eight years old. You know, there was never any music on that, and you know, to me. And my dad bought my brother and I little guitars, a little three-quarter size electrics when we were kids. And I just kind of started playing it because I thought it looked cool. But I didn't take any lessons. I just I wanted it to sound like a big bar chord. So I just would I just open tuned it so it would all sound in key. I didn't know what I was doing, but it just sounded right. Right. I was basically doing a big drop D (laughs) tuning. And then I realized I could one finger it and just play because at the time I was I was just a big skater and loved listening to stuff like DRI, Dead Kennedys, you know all that punk stuff. And that's just easy peasy, you know. Mm-hmm. And I I could play that and and uh, so from there I just started teaching myself from those like uh, the uh, the guitar books you get on how to tune it. And I took maybe three or four guitar lessons and the guy gave me every major minor chord my first day to learn for the next week because he knew I was advanced. And then basically it was just him kind of keeping up, telling me to keep practicing, and I didn't see the point in that. Because right. I wanted him to teach me how to play Guns N' Roses solos, and he wouldn't do it. He's <laughs> like, you're better than that. I'm going to teach you how to do so you can learn on your own. And I said, now screw this, I'm out. And, any regrets with that? Um, you know, I, I, I've never considered myself a guitar player until the last maybe five years. I mean, I've played my whole life. Right. The guitar to me has just been the catalyst to, to sing. I, it, it's just been something to sing along with. And uh, I have to be surprised by the guitar. I mean, every guitar here is probably in a different tuning. I never, almost ever use basic standard tunings. And uh, it's because if I, I am so good at hearing something and knowing what it is. Like if I hear a melody, I can go, oh, that's that song or that song. And I can. And when I start doing that, I get trapped. And I can't be creative because I'm like, that sounds just like R.E.M. That sounds just like that Radiohead tune or whatever. But if I tune the guitar backwards and do all this stuff and, you know, use whatever and, you know, stand upside down. And the next thing I know, all I'm doing is playing E, B and C. But it's 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 a whole different voicing and it sounds completely unique to me. So I take my own brain out of it and I can actually just write. And it's I make things much more difficult than it has to be. (laughs) But uh, that's how I. I come up with that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. well, that's probably what makes you so original. I guess, yeah, I guess. So you join bands in high school. There's an interest there. When does it become? I'm going to go for it. You there's know? never been any doubt that this is what I was going to do. I can remember making a conscious decision in like eighth grade or seventh grade, maybe that that young. Because eighth grade, I was already playing in the bands and stuff. Because probably seventh grade, I knew I either wanted to be a pro skater or or be in a band or play music. And I broke my wrist. Um, my left wrist skating and I had to wear a cast and I couldn't get my hand around a guitar neck so I couldn't make core and it and it with that maddening feeling I was, I was like I'll never ever ever do that again I'm never I can't do, live without this and I remember that being a defining moment for me as the sticking with that but I've always known I was going to be in a band and do do this stuff and I uh, I guess my senior year at Myers Park mm-hmm. I had already skipped like, you know, weeks worth of school before the first quarter. I mean, I'd never went. And um, the teachers had called and my parents and were like, you know, he's already missed so much school. He's going to have to go to summer school. We weren't even at the halfway point yet. It was like, he's going to have to go to summer school already. And they knew I wasn't going to go to summer school in my senior year, you know. <laughs> and uh, and at that point, I had already gone to L.A. to record a couple songs with uh, um, some local musicians here that were sort of, fathering me is like managing me kind of and uh they were session players that had done a lot of big jazz records country music stuff like that okay. and they took me to la when i was like 17 to record some demos in a big studio and and uh with studio guys and that must it, have blown your mind it, 
it was completely blew my mind. <laughs> and uh, so after the whole thing with the school and realized that I was going to have to go to my parents, my dad still says he swears this isn't how it went, but I know this is how it went. <laughs> He he had he said, well, why don't you just get your GED and just go ahead and get you on this path of music now? I mean, what's the point? You're not going to go. You're obviously not going to graduate. You're not going to, or unless you do this or that. It's like, so I got my GED and I went to LA um, again, probably before my senior year would have been out, and spent another like two weeks and recorded a bunch of other songs that I had. That's kind of what. That's kind of how it started. And then my manager out in LA at the time was the one that suggested I move out to LA he lived in a duplex and the downstairs was just opened up and was for rent and he said if he moved in uh, he could be under my wing I would I could you know make sure he's safe and I know he's young and but but so Benji and I moved out to LA and um, Jonathan moved out and there's the three of us and we started rehearsing and stuff and was it, when did Muscadine come about for Benji? Muscadine started after I basically fired them, told them to move and get the hell out. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, uh, we were young, you know, we were so young. And those guys were, uh, you know, my dad was fronting the bill for everything. And all he asked that the guys get a job. It doesn't matter if it was delivering pizza, just yeah, something. Right. Just show a little effort, you know. And they refused and... Uh, you know, they were burning through my groceries like no one's business. Just little things like that. And it just wasn't working out musically. And basically it was kind of felt like they were freeloading and then talking shit behind my back and all this kind of garbage that you go through when you're 17. <laughs> so I had to kind of tell them, I was like, look, you know, you don't have to leave L.A., but you can't stay here. I'm kind of giving you a two-week notice here to figure it out. And then right after that, the earthquake hit. And that was uh, Northridge, which was okay. fucking awful. And uh, Benji freaked out, and he was on the next flight back home. He did never to be seen again. You know, he split, and then Beck had just kind of come out, and Beck looked like Benji at the time, and it freaked Benji out, so he shaved his head. And uh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. And then Jonathan was like begging to stay. He's like, "Please let me stay. I don't want it." And I was like, "I didn't." And he's like, "You know, he just talked so much shit about Benji being the worst. He can't play. He's terrible." And then he moves back, and they start muscadine. It's like I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> Here. It was so weird. That seems like a whole. That was a couple lights ago. Actually. So was that like ninety four? Does that sound right? Mm-hmm. I also have a couple years later. You mentioned after a week, and you you had some recordings you did in A and M Studios. Yeah, yeah, that would have um, been like ninety six around that time. Okay, so after you kick those guys to the curb, what? How do you feel those two years? Uh, you- well, I I I played with uh, started playing with the band um, with a couple other guys. Uh, one of which would become my roommate, Noah, Noah Levin's on. He's in the band now called Asian She. And him and one of my old best friends, they're, they're two of my best friends actually in L.A. And um, Noah and I would end up living together for a long time. And he'd play in a different, different versions of my bands over, over the years. But I worked with them for a couple of years. And then Celia Green was my first like, band. I started out there. That was like the, that, that, that was the band that... Christopher Thorne from Blind Melon, those guys would hear about that would eventually get me to you know work with them. Mm-hmm. So that was that was the catalyst for all. And that. what were the opportunities like at that time for you? Were you getting demo deals? I, I got I got a publishing deal when I was probably nineteen. Huge publishing deal, and it was from the band that I joined uh, after Benji and Jonathan left. It's kind of a cool story because I had my manager had had planned on taking me to his friends at Chrysalis Music, but he didn't think I was ready yet. But at the same time, he managed some other, one of those other, ah, oh, crap. It was, it's like a Nine Inch Nails-y kind of 80s band. They're, I'll, I'll think of it. Anyway, okay. he was sending, I guess they had, they were part of Chrysalis or something, and they were looking for, no, no, they were looking for a publishing deal, and he sent my buddy, or he sent a, his friend uh, a tape of their music, you know, to to listen to, he 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 mixed mix it up. He sent my tape to the to Chrysalis, and they loved it. And they thought this doesn't sound like so and so. This is totally unique. And he goes, "Oh shit, that's that didn't mean to send you that. He's not ready." And they're like, "We want to meet with this guy." And like weeks later, I had this huge publishing deal. That was pretty awesome. What were those meetings like? I mean, you're still a young, fairly young. Kid. I was so full of you know myself. I mean, I I was still so young, and I I mean I. You know, when you're that young, you just think, oh, I'm going to be huge, you know, and I'm just, I'm just going to take over the whole world and it's going to be, it's all going to be perfect. You right. Know? And, Which I think would help though, to have that. Well, yeah. You have to, and, you know, there's got to be that healthy bit of narcissism yeah. in there to, 
to, to I mean, that's you, you got to be nuts in that respect. And, yeah. yeah. But back then, it you know, this was still pre uh, digital music and all that stuff. So right. you still had you know labels with 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 A and R guys and and you know they wanted you know back when labels wanted to help you know evolve a musician and, and grow their you know right. they don't see that anymore. <laughs> The old three album, uh, yeah, yeah, buffer, yeah, all right. So then, as you you mentioned, you, you start meeting the guys that eventually becomes Luma, which eventually right, becomes right, right. Unified Theory, yeah, yeah. Because it seems to be a, that's about five years in your stay, roughly. Yeah, that's yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, because it would have been probably around the end of '97 when I met Christopher, because we didn't really become a band. We could just see. I was in Seattle for New Year's of. 99 so I was there during 98 like that. did you move there or yeah that was just yeah okay. I moved to Seattle for a couple of years my manager at the time called me and said do you know Christopher Thorne I was like no he goes well you know Blind Melon I was like oh yeah he's like well he called and I said let me guess you're looking for a singer you know I mean, obviously Shannon had died only mm-hmm. a couple of years before that and I was still so full of myself that I kind of thought you know I was thinking the same like I don't want to I'm not going to be that guy you know I'm still putting my stuff together you know and I, I honestly was a little cautious about it I wasn't like you know, doing backflips, ooh, blind melon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's not how I looked at it. But Christopher and I met, and you know, Christopher to this day is one of my most favorite people ever. I mean, I love the guy to death, and we hit it off immediately. And anyone who knows Christopher, I think, feels the same way. He's just, he's just a joy to be around. You know, his, his the records he's made and produced, and the bands he's been in is testament to that. Mm-hmm. People just like to work with him because he's fun. He's funny. He's so easy to be around with, but you know, we at, we at first had talked about him maybe playing in my band, which he he was considering. But he goes, well, let's just do this first. Why don't you come up to Seattle and meet Brad, who was the bass player, mm-hmm. and um, you know, let's let's see how it goes. And I spent two weeks up there, and in two weeks we recorded two songs with Dave Cruzen playing drums, and it was on. I mean. We were thrilled with what we put together in that short period of time, and it was we just knew we had something. You know, we agreed that we would go into this thing as this was not going to be Blind Melon. This wasn't going to be. Right. This was going to be. Um, everything would be new from that point on. It, anything that came into the band was going to be a joint effort, and so it made me feel better about coming into like it wasn't some side guy, and it was it right. was our band. You know, and that's kind of how that that got started, and then it it, it was a no brainer. I was so excited to be up there. And, and and it was still late '90s. It was still, it was such a, it was still a really cool scene. Mm-hmm. There were some really great bands, and you know Reggie Watts was a good friend of ours, and he had a band called Mach Two, and they used to open up for Unified Theory. And um, I mean, everyone knew he was destined to be a star. Yeah. That guy was just so talented. Now, yeah. was there any hurdle even getting up there? I mean, this is this is a minutia no, question. It was easy. It was easy because a year before I met Christopher, my house burned down. Okay, and that was the incredibly hor- horrific thing to go through and uh i moved into a house um with an old friend of mine dean carr who's a very famous video director yeah, yeah. did everything from dave matthews to ozzy mm-hmm. to deftones to you name it i mean everybody and we we were roommates for a, a, the year of 97 or 96 97 and uh, that was a decadent crazy year because his career had just was just blowing up i mean every other day it was like either manson was at the house perry farrell day i mean it was really just a who's who of rock and roll was coming through our doors and hanging out i mean it was it was amazing um but i didn't you know we were renting the house we were renting actually was um ian mccallum's house okay and this is way before gandalf and all that stuff he was doing (laughs) richard the third or Richard the he had done that movie he was doing a play in 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 London like a long year long thing so we were leasing the house it was furnished and everything it was beautiful old Studer I think it's where he still lives um yeah, it's crazy side stories a lot of those peppered in here that's what we're here for but we uh so moving to moving to Seattle was a no-brainer because I didn't really feel connected we hadn't we were about to have to renew a lease I wasn't sure I wanted to do that I, I kind of wanted my own place I mean Dean <laughs> Dean's a trip. I love him to death. It's it's just we're very you know strong individuals, and he at the time he was he was ripping it up, and I mean with the booze and the drugs and the ladies, and I mean you talk about I mean he'd have Sabbath blaring at like eight in the morning, 
before he'd go to work, you know, and and I mean blaring like the house would be shaking. He had speakers in his bedroom, almost as tall as his room, facing the bed. I mean, it, it was straight out of like it, it, like Wayne and Guard. It was some right. joke. It was ridiculous. It's hilarious. <laughs> What's he doing today? Did he ever transition he, to movies? I, uh, I remember no, he st- he still does videos. He he does a lot of photography though. He's he does a ton of that, and it's just hard. I mean, the 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 it's the it's changed. Yeah, yeah, for sure, it's changed. Everyone's got iPhones now, and they can. Yeah. And, and content is just that content. It doesn't have to be shot. You know, the days of shooting a two hundred thousand dollar video are done. I mean, yeah. you know, unless you're Beyonce or something. He still gets work, and he does. He, he did a video for Corn just uh, like a year or so ago that won a bunch of awards, and it's killer. It's yeah. just like old old school. <laughs> okay, so Unified Theories, you know, it's, it's working out really well for you guys. There's good chemistry. Do they already have, you know? I mean, by now you've got relationships in the business. They've just come off a tragedy. With, they have relationships in the business. Mm-hmm. What's what's the move to, to try to bring in a, a record company to you know to get on board? The move was we knew we had something cool because we knew we had the name Blind Melon and we knew we had the name Pearl Jam because Dave was in the band. Right. And we knew right off the bat there there would be records sold just on those names. We wanted to be very careful about it, and we uh, we went and we wanted to meet with attorneys first. So we hired an attorney, um, Alan Mintz, who, who would later become one of my dearest friends and managed me later, way years after that point, um, and even moved to Nashville, and him and I were very good friends. He passed away a couple of years ago, um, uh, which was brutal. You mm-hmm. know, um, I was with him. It was, you know, but anyway, that was the beginning of that friendship. Alan came in. So we knew we, knew we needed support. We needed someone to legally help us out. So he came in. And that's an sorry to interrupt, but that's an early lesson you guys have already, you know, that's a smart business move right, where right. you were in your career. Right. In hindsight, the only thing that might that might have bit us in the ass is that we literally the the timing was so awful for us because we we got Alan, we took our first trip to L.A. and we we found Alan. We spent a couple a week or two there and met with all sorts of attorneys, tons of them, and Alan's when we we picked. And uh, when we went back down a month or so later to shop for labels, it was right when Interscope bought everybody out. A&M, Geffen, people were kicked out of the doors, you know, the black wrap around A&M sign, all that crazy dark stuff. People, that all the guys we knew in the business, A&R dudes, label people, were jobless. All the bars were full of these A&R guys, like, you know, bummed out. And, you know, the ones that kept their jobs could only were only working with Britney Spears. Right. In sync stuff like that. They hated it. Mm-hmm. They had to. That was their job. Now they didn't get to work with cool bands, and uh, it was an ugly, ugly time. So suddenly here we are trying to get a record deal, right when all that happened, and Napster had just I was hit. Say Napster and the whole. We we couldn't have picked it. I mean, if we if we'd have been a year before, it would have been different. Right. It would have been completely different. Um, but it just we it just was awful. It sucked. So you end up with a. Universal Imprint, three thirty-three. Yeah, Tom Shadyac was it was his label. Tom Shadyac's the film director that directed Ace Ventura, Liar Liar. Okay, okay. Um, Bruce Almighty, all the big, <laughs> huge Jim Carrey movies. He grossed like twenty-two million dollars. No more than that. Gosh, uh, but that became might have been his, that became B, his investment to, to get a an imprint. Yeah, his dream was to have a label. <laughs> he always wanted to have her, his his dream. His his love was music, and he loved our band. I mean, he absolutely loved us, and we dumped the ugh, we dumped the label. I just, I, I, in hindsight, looking back, it's just you guys did. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to. I mean, whenever those big decisions come up, I, I just, I always, money just fucks everything up. People get so bent out of shape because they think they can get a little more here or there, and then when you, as soon as you start grabbing and picking and choosing and saying, well, if we if we sidestep this and went over there, you know, we might get. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter, but it, I'm just I'm just, I I don't if don't rock the boat is yeah. how, is how I like to roll. And but you guys did correct me if I'm wrong. You guys did record a, a self titled album. Did it did it roll out? Did you get the we, whole? We recorded it on our own um, at the at Christopher and Brad's house houses in um, Seattle. The other thing where we kind of might have shot ourselves in the foot is that you know a lot of the labels wanted us to redo the record with a different producer. Like Atlantic really wanted to sign us, and that would have been amazing. I really would have loved to have been in Atlantic, and 
Um, but the only reason that it wasn't working is because the other guys refused to redo yeah. the record. And it was hard to argue with because they were eager to get going. Mm-hmm. You know, it would have put us another year behind. In that respect, I, I agreed. But the other part of me was like, well, screw it, you know. Let's work with someone awesome. And, and, and you, you got to give them a little to give them the incentive to want to get on board and involved. Sure. And I'm, I'm all about that, too. But, you know, hindsight, I, I mean, whatever. Right. So did that album end up being released just as you guys, yeah. just just as is? Yeah, a guy named David Bottrell came in to mix it. We went to Vancouver, spent like a month up there, and he mixed he, he mixed the record. David uh, David was, uh, did the, the, all the Tool records, and he did one of our favorite records at the time, one of my all-time favorite records, the Peter Gabriel um, soundtrack to Passion of Christ. Okay. He did that record, and, and he worked with a band called Remy Zero. Yeah, yeah. When we loved yeah. those guys, and, and he did he did this record called Vila Elaine, which we at the time yeah. was one of our favorite, and we always got compared to those guys. It's funny so. you mentioned that. That's exactly what I picked out when I was yeah. listening to your stuff. Mm-hmm. We 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 got a lot of comparisons to those to those guys. He did that record, so okay, yeah. So he mixed the record. But uh, other than that, we we did everything. Did they roll it out and you tour and you're you know yeah like- yeah oh we toured a bunch. I mean, the two years I was in Seattle, we half the time we were on the road. I mean, we toured a lot for that record. Stateside or any Europe or Canada stateside. We, we never did go to Europe. Headlining or opening headlining. Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, we did do, uh, well, the irony is we toured with live and that's how that so all started, you know, cause Christopher was friends with them and he had played on the distance to hear record that Jerry Harrison was producing. Okay. And, and, uh, what's funny. I saw they, that, there was like an MTV 120 Minutes tour, I think, mm-hmm. and it was live Blind Melon, yeah. Public Image Limited, and yeah. Big yeah. Auto Dynamite. So mm-hmm. I think yep. that's how they kind of mm-hmm. might have crossed paths. And then Unified Theory ended pretty quickly. Yeah, relatively. I still don't. Hours. I still don't understand it. I still to this day don't don't really understand. Well, I mean, I well, I I do I do I I get it, but I still don't get it. <laughs> right. it, it's it, there was never like a meeting there's never like hey this isn't we're not a band anymore it's just like Ignore it, it, no it just it, it's I, I just it still makes me so mad because there's no reason why we couldn't have continued to be a band right it's just fucking stupid I mean we could have all done different things and still done Unified Theory the thing was we had reached a point where we had finished a second record recording the second record we had tried and tried to get another deal we had done every showcase you could possibly imagine. We had no more shows booked. Nothing was happening. We had been we had toured and done so much work. And I said, I've taken two weeks off. I'm going to Seattle to see our friends up there. I haven't seen it forever. My buddy's just opened a skate park. I wanted to go skate it and do all these things. And uh, apparently it didn't sit too well with one of the guys. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that was the catalyst. They thought that, you know, I really don't, I think that might have been the catalyst. I don't know. No one's ever really told me. But it, It's funny when you Google it, unfortunately you get a lot of... Uh... Einstein's theory, <laughs> and it's hard to find. Right, oh, yeah, like there yeah. is there is a Facebook page that that I, I found an article, and I can't remember the band member, but he did say the chemistry just wasn't there anymore. Yeah, you know, we couldn't get in a room and be productive or something, or, or you know, but yeah. it was very bad. Some of us are easier to work with than others, you know, and, <laughs> and that's that's for sure. So it, it seems like there's a uh, a gap between. The end of Unified Theory and what I consider is your your solo album mm-hmm. that I guess you must have worked on 2010 2011. In between that is I must be everything is energy. Mm-hmm. So what was that? Yeah, that was um, me and uh, Thomas Froggett. Thomas was the bass player in Vast, and that's a band we had toured with with Unified Theory. Um, and Thomas and I just hit hit it off. We became very good friends and. Uh, we put together a band with uh, uh, drummer Kirk Jan. Kirk played with Hours, Jimmy Necco, the singer, who another mutual friend, and so we had a band, the three of us, for you know a while. That's that's what that's what we did, and we did a couple little tours and um, nothing too crazy, and and that's post. This is the post Napster apocalypse yeah, of the music yeah. industry. So, what were your goals for that band in particular? We were looking for a record deal, still, something like that. And, and then Alan, our attorney for Unified Theory, was still working with me and, and was managing us. We were trying to, you know, it, it, if it wasn't one thing, it was another. It's like, looking back, it's so crazy, because my buddy, um, Chris Sharma, who's an incredible engineer and producer, 
um, was working with us, and um, he was sort of a band member at the end there. He'd actually play like shows. He would do keyboards and stuff with us. But he uh, he was making our record with us, and right in the middle of it, um, he uh, had to go to uh, France to finish to do the Rolling Stones because he was working with a guy named Don Waz. Him and Don are it's he's Don's like second. He's done every record Don does. Chris is his is with him. Mm-hmm. So they were doing the Stones and like. You can't complain. It's like our guy is in France for months on end, and we're just frozen. And it's so funny to look back on that because now I could do all that, right? You know, you, but at the time I didn't know how to do any of that. I didn't know, you know, my mindset was like that. I'm not an engineer. Yeah, I'm the musician. I know where to go, and I know who's awesome. And it's just when it's time, you go into a place and you record it, and then that's how you do it. And you let them do their thing, and I'll do my thing. And now it's literally you have to do everything. <laughs> everything or it's, it will never get done yeah <laughs> so that you know we and you know what i burned a lot of years drinking and just wasting time you know just i mean i i, I don't know so that brings me to what became your solo i believe what became your solo album yeah and what's intriguing to me and correct again correct me if i'm wrong but it's it's these studios that are intriguing to me mm-hmm. you know ocean way recording mm-hmm. sound emporium yeah and uh uh, Rancho de la Luna, mm-hmm. that became your solo album, all those visits? No, or? no, the solo album, the one that came out of Nashville. Yeah, yeah, the, or the one that's on uh, Spotify is, your, is just a Christian album. Yeah, yeah, that was all Nashville stuff. Okay, and is that when you're using the Murderous Row of Musicians? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that kind of came as a concept, I mean, because you know what, I, I had kind of reached a point that even, that my dad came to me, he's like, what's going on, you know? What's happening with the music? What's happening? And I was like, you know, it's it's just a, a waiting and waiting and waiting game. You know, we, we can only play these clubs in L.A. so many times. Right. You know, it's like, I don't know what else to do. And he goes, well, uh, he, had, he said, well, didn't you ever want to go to Nashville? And I said, well, I had a concept for a record um, that I ran by him. I said, the, the concept was I wanted to do kind of like a cover song record. Right. Travel around of my favorite cities and hang out with my favorite musicians and do a song of each with different people, different bands, and kind of make a record of you know cool old cover tunes. Mm-hmm. That turned into well, maybe go to Nashville and and use some uh, make amazing players and do that there. So I said, well, you know, in order for it to work, it has to be all or nothing because it's got to be the best of the best. Period. I, I'm not. I don't want to mess around. It's got to be like incredible. And he goes, well, if I if I fund it, will you do that? And I was like, yeah, I'll totally do it. I'd love to do it. So he funded that, and and you know, I was like, I don't even want to see what some of this stuff costs, because it'll, because honestly, that gets in my brain, and then yeah, I, yeah. I then I sort of feel like somehow you somehow equate a dollar sign to what you need to be doing, or what right. you, and then it'll screw the whole creative process. But did you up. have parameters, time? I mean, you had no. time. You didn't. No, okay. it, the parameters were. I mean, I, the one thing I said I wanted Billy Ward to play drums, and Billy was a guy who played on my stuff when I was seventeen. And I was a kid, and he came out, and he was, I mean, he's just this incredible, you should look him up. He's I've a, seen the videos. Yeah, Billy is, um, Billy is a very famous drummer, and, yeah. and drum and, and drummers in know drum who circles. he is. He yeah. is a very famous clinician and um, just a real badass, and I, I said, I want Billy to, to be the drummer, and, and, you know, that's first. If I don't get him, then I'll wait, because I, I, I want to make sure I get Billy. Billy was totally on board. And then at that point, um, I put my old friend Tim Smith, uh, who the bass player, I put him in charge of putting the band together. And Tim was the guy who managed me and you like Imaginary Heroes, and he's the one that was responsible for getting me to L.A. and meeting you know these my future manager, and that he's the one that kind of helped launch everything. Tim was a guy. I said, look, I want you, to, I, I want the best guitar player. I want the best, you know, this, 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 and he put together a band. Um, And uh, it's so funny because the night before our first day of recording, my old friend Noah from L.A., he called. He's like, so what's happening? Who's playing guitar on the record? And I said, this guy named Brent Mason. He goes, Brent Mason is playing? And I was like, yeah, you know who he is? He's like, dude, Brent Mason's incredible. And then I got nervous. (laughs) I was like, shit, don't tell me that. And then I had to Google him like, oh, man, he is amazing. Um but all these guys are legendary. Paul Franklin is the the steel player of, in yeah. the world. Is like the guy. Well, I was, I was trying to articulate it in the shortest way, but you had players that played with Elvis mm-hmm. to 
pretty much Taylor Swift, I think. Yeah, we see yeah, and Bonnie Raitt, and you name it. I mean, these guys play with I mean, everybody. That's crazy. So, um, and so you say. I mean, it's funny you say you were nervous, and you're not the young kid with the chip on your shoulder, we're, right? We're, yeah, you know, but you were your own boss at this point. Yeah, yeah. So, it was funny, too, because they totally busted my balls right off the bat. So I had this room full of these legendary guys. You know, in Nashville, man, they do it by times. It's like you do, they do the, the in three-hour blocks. It's like you got the, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner blocks, you know. And, and when it's when it's 9 o'clock or when it's noon, it's like, all right, pencil, paper, they sit down, it's work. And before we started the session, I said, I want to get everyone in the room, and, and I wanted to just tell everyone what it meant. And I I kind of want, you know, just to thank him. And one of the guys walked in and goes, okay, it's just going to take long. He's completely busted my balls, embarrassed the shit out of me. And it just set the tone for this is going to be fun, man. We're, we're going to have a blast. And it just, everyone, it was it was nonstop laughter and uh, some of the scariest music, like, technically, I've, I've ever been a part of. And um, I learned so much uh, from watching these guys work. I mean, it was a whole different experience yeah. from anything I'd ever done. I mean... Completely different. Well, it's, I mean, it's a really great disc. It yeah. really is, I mean, and it's, it's completely different from anything I'll, I've done since. I, I'll play you some stuff now, and it, I mean, what I'm doing now is much heavier, and it's nothing mm-hmm. like you know. Um, it's a, it's this is more the record I've wanted to make for many, many years that I'm making now. But that that record was I resigned to the 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 players. I had the songs, the ideas. Some of the arrangements weren't even really completed. Right. I just kind of had this is kind of how it goes, and I had most lyrics and. I played them the acoustic. I said, this is the tempo I wanted at. And this is, you know, I kind of had the idea to start it like this and maybe, you know, and they'd all kind of come up with some ideas and literally play the song maybe three times and and it would be like perfect. And I'd hear things in the speakers like, who's doing that sound? And where where is that coming from? And uh, it's, they all just knew how to stay out of each other's way. It was incredible. How long did basic tracks take? Not long. Um, we did a, We did a handful of sessions though over a long period of time. And the hard part was really just kind of me coming up with arrangements and, and lyrics, and that's mm-hmm. always the hard part for me yeah. is finishing the singing. Because, you know, I try to tell people the hardest part about singing is, isn't once the song's written and it's recorded and done, it's easy to sing, re-sing it and go out and do it, do it. Coming up with the attitude, the character of right. w- how you say it is so, is what it's all about for me. And it's not... Just about, man, you can sing that, sing it. It's like, no, 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 It's not like that. Yeah, I can sing the notes, but you can, people can see right through yeah. when you mean it or you don't mean right. it. They know the, the difference. People are not stupid. And that's, that's what people, you know, gets people to lean into the speakers and they feel it. And they want to hear every, they're hanging on every word because they know you mean it. You know, I could say, hey, 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 hey. Yeah. There's a thousand <laughs> different ways to say something. And just the slightest little inflections and. You know, I know it drives some people mad, but that's what makes me me. And yeah. But that is what people take. I mean, I think music lovers do take away certain aspects of songs and certain, you mm-hmm. know, inflections that mm-hmm. they look forward to hearing, you know, in a particular song. Yeah. So, um, it, it's funny because looking at all the stuff you did, you had a video crew doing, you know, you did mm-hmm. have, do have a little bit of documentary. Mm-hmm. I noticed your social media at the time was in the third person. So it was either somebody running it or yeah. you yeah. running it as if someone's no, running I it. No, I didn't do any of that. You so. had... Um, a showcase in New York, mm-hmm. but it's all you. This mm-hmm. is your, you, yeah. Your, you guys are driving the ship, yeah. And did it bear any fruit? Air, no, that the that whole thing, the life got pulled out, the rug got pulled out from under it. We just there was um, a lot of personal stuff within my family went down. Okay, and I had to move from LA. Um, I didn't want to. There was a lot of it was financial stuff. A lot of things just completely got shifted, and and the family got, you know, the whole family kind of got shifted around, and mm-hmm. it's it really, I don't really know how to say anything about it. Sure, too too personal. That's but, fine. But it but it, it 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 was really really awkward and pretty pretty awful, and uh, um, I, I I there was a long time there I didn't know if the family was going to make it through with some of this moving around that happened. Sure, and it just any sort of work that had to do with the the album just got stopped. And right when all this happened was when Alan died, uh-huh. and Alan dying was another like it just I, I didn't know just things um, things you piling on. Yeah, and uh, um, Alan passed away right after I had met up with Live. I Live was like a 
was like a life raft. And I sidestepped. I just, I just left L.A. I left the solo record, and I just jumped on board 100% live and kicked away and it never looked back. Okay. And so that's why nothing ever happened with that. That's, it's interesting you say that because it seemed like that solo work at times overlapped. Yeah. But it seems to make it was, sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And without getting into it, I think you, you've answered the question. But at the time, I think when you were um, pushing your solo album, you, you were there was a quote from you saying, my definition of success changed dramatically some years ago. Mm-hmm. And I think that was based on yeah. family is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, success is, yeah. you know. And, it, and, you know, that, that yeah, I mean, that's true, I think, of, of everybody, and it continues to change. For instance, now, you know, like we talked about being younger and having that healthy bit of narcissism, and, you know, I'm so not even anywhere close to that guy anymore, you know. Um, I know that what I do is good, and I, I'm very aware of my capabilities and all that, but what I don't have at all anymore is is the need to, you know, knock on doors or put up flyers or or shout it from the mountaintops. I just don't have that. And yeah. I don't, I don't feel the need to do it. Um, but, uh, but there is an obligation that I think artists feel in general that to share what you do. And cause I know for a fact that, that there are people that, that are moved mm-hmm. by the work, you know? And so there's this, there's this obligation and there's, that's the constant struggle of, you know, a lot of people go, well, you haven't really done anything. You must not be doing like, what do you mean? I'm, I, I'm, I'm living my life yeah. I, just because, just because I'm not, uh, opening for Def Leppard, uh, doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. I wasn't doing fuck all then either. What, you know, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? If, um, sorry, I got sidetracked. I no, 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 but it's, it, 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 no, it's, it's, well, I mean, people's you, perspective you, you, of stuff is so yeah. strange. You know, sure. they, they, well, they, it's, it's the, the, they feel like they're owed something. Yeah, you're owed yeah. nothing. Yeah, exactly. You know, we appreciate. Um, I, you right, know, you appreciate your fans, but you know, right, you are a human. Right, you do have human needs, and that's you know, and that's I guess part of what this is something that Alan and I would talk about all the time is where we saw eye to eye on is the one thing missing from a lot of music in 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 general is there's no mystery anymore, and there's and that's always driven me crazy, and you know. Uh, you know, the only motherfucker doing it now would be like Maynard in in yeah, Tool yeah. Or, or Perfect Circle, who yeah. now I know I know a lot of those guys, and we just saw them the other night here in town. And yeah. um, you know, I know it pisses people off that you can't film their shows and you get kicked out if you do. And then, but I mean, having said that, I mean, it, it it forces you. It was it was amazing to be at that show, and there really wasn't a single phone out, yeah. nobody, no one, and it was really cool and it adds it really does add something it's like you are watching the show you're present you're watching the show and he can do that he can get away with it because people still want to see him you know it's like if you really hate it that bad don't fucking go you don't have to go <laughs> yeah. so i like that but you know we, th- we we would talk about how you know what if led zeppelin had an instagram account you know it just would take away from that you don't need to see what robert plant had for breakfast you know that that's not doesn't it's not important so the one thing you do have going for you is what people don't know. Let people let them let their wheels spin. Let them let them not know. So yeah. what? It's none of their business ultimately. I mean, it's you know I, I'm really careful about what I put out, what I po- post. I mean, because I, I I know how things can be perceived, and ultimately I just I don't care. You know, I, mm-hmm. I I'm uh, I mean I care about the fans and I care about you know the music making an effect on people, but. You know, I wish that I could have this record done right now and put it out, but it's not quite, quite ready. Yeah. And I, I know people probably think I'm turning into that guy that's always, oh, he'll never, no, no, no. It's like, you know, you say that until it's out and then it's out. It's like, oh my God, oh, oh this is good. It's just, just whatever. Yeah. If it's not one thing, it's a fucking other thing. Mm-hmm. Let's jump into live. Okay. It's funny that you, you led into it that it was a lifeline. Yeah. To you at the time, yeah, which is very interesting. What must must have made it sting all the more, yeah, you know, when it ended. And I don't think there's a, a whole lot to talk about. I think, you know, I think just the how did it come about? Mm-hmm. I think is inter- interesting to hear if you. There's yeah, no, no, no. It, well, first of all, let me just say a couple things. Uh, it was great, and if I refer to the band, if I say they, I'm just going to say they. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not going to single any one sure. person out. I think that's probably. The, probably the better way to do it 
because I don't want to throw any one particular person under the bus or whatever, because they all made the decision together. Right. So they, but when they contacted me, I got a phone call, and actually they did. They are all on speakerphone, the whole band, and just wanted to know how I was doing, if I was still making music, what was going on. And it started with they had some commercial opportunities to maybe use some of their old hits and they wanted to do some re-records. And they had the rights to do that and right. they wanted to do re-records and thought that I could re-sing some of the old hits and then they could you know, use them for commercial work, whatever. And I, I was like, yeah, that's easy breezy. I'd love to do that. I said, I could sing circles around that shit. I'd love, I'd love to do it, yeah. Um, that's where it started. It wasn't, you're going to be in live. It mm -hmm. wasn't, that was not even something they ever considered off the, right off the bat. We just started, I went up to Pennsylvania and we started playing and it sounded really good and it, tr it freaked them out, totally freaked them out that, you know, they, they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe they were hearing. Um, and it was just fun. We mm -hmm. had, a, we just got along great. We, we had a great time. And we, we actually recorded, we did a lot of the re-records at uh, Sound Emporium in Nashville, and that's kind of how it started. And then it was, you know, man, we could do this. We could, they were like, we could really do this. I said, yeah, you sh fuck yeah, you could. And <laughs> we, I told them from the could. very beginning, I said, you know, and, and if you do it, you know, change the rules up. We don't have to, you know, don't, he was like, well, we got to do a press release. And I'm like, no, you the fuck you don't. Don't do it about what? For, for what? Why do you have to do a press release about for, for me? Like, what difference does it make? I mean, if it's live, it's live. And that's just how I looked at it. It's like, all your, you know, I don't need that. I don't need you to do that for me. So they were like, huh, that's interesting. And like, you know, I said, if you, you know, it's live, it's live. People, people will know. It, it, it will be un, un, understood that it's someone else. They'll figure it out. Let them figure it out on their own and arrive at that bring, conclusion. Bring the mystery. These are the mysteries. Yeah. These are the things that I, I'm, all, I'm all about. Because, you know, don't come out, well, here we go, everybody, ta-da. Because now you're just setting me up to fucking suck. Everyone's going to go, oh, well, there's a the guy I don't like. That's the face of the dude that I don't already like, you know. So don't do that. Let's freak them out when they come to a show and go, what, what? And that's what we did. Right. People would, you know, it was funny to see people, you know, I could see them in the crowd. And then within, by the time the first song was over, it was like Jaws. And <laughs> like, what? Was that the York? Did you guys play a, a York show? Yeah, our first show was in New York. We did a big home home crowd mm -hmm. audience, and I barely remember it because it was just like so surreal, um, huge show. In my perspective, which the perspective of any layman, mm -hmm. but it feels like they've done a good job of staying grounded within their home community. Oh yeah, uh, they invest there. So oh, did yeah. you 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 felt well? Did you oh, feel welcome into? Oh, oh, absolutely. I love the people of York were just like the most lovely. And I, we, you know, I've met some of my best friends now that live there that unfortunately I'll probably never go back mm -hmm. to York. It's, I, I don't have any reason to right. go other than to see maybe two people, but everyone was just so lovely. And those guys are heroes there. And, and, uh, um, you know, they've done a ton of really wonderful things for the community and, and they stayed, they stayed on, yeah. you know, and, and that's something to be said for that. And the town loves them. They can't really do anything wrong. Mm-hmm. So when everything's you know going well, you're touring the U.S., Europe, Australia. I mean, you mentioned yeah. Def Leppard. You guys yeah. did it for Def Leppard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Def Leppard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. I mean, do you consider that some of the high, highest highs of your career, or is yeah, it, oh, yeah. or is it yeah. as good as you know other highs? You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I guess scale wise, is it something like this? Is this oh, is what I'm sure. yearning to do? For sure. Well, know? well, it always felt. You know, you, you, you work, you put in so many hours and endless amounts of thousands of hours into your craft. And then to finally arrive, you know, I, I would compare it to um, big wave surfing is what I would what I kind of compared it to. That uh, there's just not a lot of people that get to do that and can do it. Mm -hmm. And um, to be able to stand where I've been able to stand um, in front of the people I've been able to, you know, and, and do that is... There just aren't, there's a very small percentage of people actually alive in the world that get to do that. You know, I've never taken that for granted. I've, I've always, you know, been very fascinated with it and, and respectful of it. And yeah, it was huge. It mm -hmm. was, a, it was, it was a lot of fun and, and 
I feel like that I am I'm made for it. I feel like I'm it's something that I I've never been afraid of and it always felt right. Yeah. You know. But even even for live, you know, it's it's just such a weird app. you know, the 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 climate for music is so strange and the only place to make mo- money is touring. Yeah. Um and we did, you know, we we did so many weird shows and you know, money gigs and things that just you know, looking back, it's like, man, I don't have to do that I- anymore. Right. And luckily, I'm not in a financial situation that I'd have to do that. But, you know, th- being in a band like that is, is strange because, you know, it's great because everyone around you thinks, oh, you're, you must, everything must be just fantastic. You're like, well, yeah, because you've seen us play in one year uh, two or three things that were enormous and huge. And that is huge. It's yeah. great. But that's a couple days yeah. of the year. The rest of that time, you know, what's addicting, I think, for you know, the fame thing is people just, it makes artists lazy and it makes, makes it, you know, it's a lot of just, I always felt like them and a lot of other people that you meet were more in love with the fact that they were in live or they were in other bands than actually the make, the making music part and, mm-hmm. you know, the perks that come along with it. And it's fun. It is cool. But I've always been able to, I don't, I can either have it or not. I mean, maybe that's because I grew up in a family with money. I've never had to want in right. that that way. And I've also grew up in a family that was in the public eye. And I've understood what, how the bad side of publicity and right. that people don't need to know everything. Yeah. I have, I have commented from a different perspective, you know. It, to me, it's not like winning the lottery, you know. It's not like, you know, I, I'm in it for the, all the right reasons, the, the musical part. Yep. But yeah, it's that's uh, so yeah. It 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 it, it, it has been the, a huge highlight. But as far as making music, I mean, nothing really will compare to the level of stuff I did in Nashville with those guys. Right. I mean, that's just that's on a completely different planet. Yeah. Um, from what what we we're doing in live, I mean, completely different planet. And there was, you know, the the musical side of me was way more turned on in that in that respect. In live, there was a lot of, you know, you're 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 you're, build, you're building a show, you know, it's showmanship. You're 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 creating stuff that you think in the live in in, the, in a live show right. will translate. Mm-hmm. You want people's butts off the seats. You want to, you know. So in that respect, you're kind of playing the game a little bit. You're kind of, you know, you're you're, you know, which which is something that I can do, and I did I did in live, and it was fine. But um, man, I tell you, it's been nice not to do that. Right now, I mean, completely the opposite for me. To <laughs> which I'll play you some stuff here in a little bit. Um, in your in your post when it became public, you know, you're very diplomatic. At one point, you said we became business partners. Yeah. Just as the name of the show, Rockonomics. I just zero in on that. Did you guys have a? Did you guys? Yeah. You know how, how so was it? Well, they yeah. they had a company. They they have a company called UFD and uh, um, United Fiber and Data, and it's like a uh, fiber network. Okay. Uh, really, <laughs> for me, what it was was just an opportunity to, to get more involved with the band because I was so one hundred percent in, and to me, it was a show of my commitment not only to the band but to their families and to the whole community. Right. And go, you know what? If you believe in this, I fucking believe in it. I'm on board. Where do I sign? You know, I want to be part of, you know, whether it's, you know, my whole attitude was if the ship goes down, I'll go down with you, you know, because that's how I'm all in. Um, So invested a ridiculous amount of money. I I never would have guessed that would be the answer. I I thought it was going to be like, uh, I noticed there was one Instagram image or social image that they, it seemed like they have their own back line. And stuff they could, you know, bus it. They could probably rent to other bands or like. Mm-hmm. But it's funny that's a fiber optic network. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It seems like it might be a. Yeah, it yeah. Might be, sounds like a good investment. Yeah. Well, it might pay out for them at some point, but I mean, I got I got the fuck out of it. Right, right. <laughs> that was part of the deal too, because uh, they got they got a business partner who who I I I don't care for at all. Right. And I don't think uh, I don't think he has. I think like, well. I think a lot of people probably could care less about the dude. And I'm sorry. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just you know, hindsight. You look back. You know, people surround themselves with certain people, and everyone. You know, I've had bad cops in my life to help me with things and uh, on on the business side of stuff. But 
you know, this particular person sent me an email that I've never been kicked so hard when I was down in my life. This guy, this guy's just vindictive and, and cruel. Right. And, uh, and, you know, I'll never forgive him for it. And, and, and unfortunately it reflects on those guys to me too. And, and it's just, it's hurtful and unbelievable. Uh, there's a lot of things that just, I, I have, I have just, sh- I've shake my head constantly. I just completely right. don't, I don't understand I don't understand. Well, even the music, you guys recorded a whole album mm-hmm. I, I, I could find it on YouTube. Couldn't find it on... Yeah, because they, they took it down. They've, they've, it's like they've gone out of their way to act as if I'm not, I wasn't a part of anything or, which just, it, to me, it's, an, it's so embarrassing. I mean, the whole reason I liked, I was so happy to get involved was because they embraced the idea of this is something new and unique. They got 100% behind me and you know, I think it's funny because from the very beginning, I always had the standpoint of, you know, this is this is short lived. You know, I know that I know the drill. This, yeah. you know, you guys will get back. Ed will come back into the picture, and I, that's fine. You know, that's how I looked at it. It wasn't me being skeptical or shitty about it. I just it's just a real. You know, these guys were friends since they were kids. Yeah, it's just, same. you know, you can't have this amazing experience in your life with these this guy and then it not come back around. But they're like, no, never, fuck that guy. You know, that'll never happen. You're our guy. You know, I'm like, man, you guys, how how can you say that? Like, you're not even, you know. Was it, uh, did it, was it, were were there any cracks or was there any warning or did it come, like, I I heard. Um, Yeah, well. I heard they got together for a beer at one point and that started. Sure. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean. I mean, I feel like it's a, I feel like it's a marriage. Like it's. Oh no, no, it totally is, and that's you know, what I. Like, wait, you're, you're going, I said, oh, well, I'm, you're a, new, I'm like the new hot drink? wife. Is basically what yeah. it was, and and. Uh, they come home, you know, and and, and I, I, this is how I explain it to. I even told them this, you know. I said, I said, look, let's be honest. If you guys were emotionally mature enough to handle shit, you know, I probably would never have been in this band. This wouldn't have been the deal. Right. Um, you ever hear the, the, the when people compare, people will say that when when a person becomes famous, they sort of stay the age mm-hmm. they they yeah, were. Yeah. That couldn't to me be more true, in this sense that those guys were like seventeen, mm-hmm. and they're 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 like a they're a gang, and uh, which I I had fun being in. It right. was fun, but they uh, I don't know. I think they're bullies, and I think that they 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 fired a lot of people for stupid reasons. I almost think they like firing people, and I don't say that lightly. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the signs to me to see them people start to get fired around me, and they would never tell me, "Oh, our manager's fired. You fired Simon. Right. Why? Why didn't you tell me about it?" It's like us the blatant disregard for me having anything to do with anything they were going to do, regardless. On um, paper, were you an equal partner? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Equal member. I was. I was never like a session guy. Right. Like I Hired wasn't paid. Guy. Yeah. I probably would have made more money had I would have been. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at the end, you know what it felt like is, you know, when like uh, you 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 hear about dudes that don't want to be with a girl anymore, so they treat her like garbage, right? And just hope she acts she I acts she crazy, and then you know that's exactly what was happening. Um, I could not believe the. Attitude, the fucking crazy. I mean, the the way they were in Australia was just so strange, and I that's like I could see it coming. It's like it's like they were begging me to act out or do something, right. and I wouldn't. I was like I I saw right through it. I could tell there was something else going on, and it was just strange to me. But you know, it was also strange to me that, that you know we we'd go to cities, go to places, and no one ever wanted they never wanted to do anything. We we play with bands that they had played with over their career, and you know didn't you know we're sitting right next door to Blues Traveler, whoever, blah blah blah, or whatever, and they wouldn't even talk to anybody. It was so weird. Yeah, it was, it was so strange. Um, there was never any camaraderie with people that they knew, and I never ever understood that. But hindsight is. You know, a lot, a lot of things are clearer to me, yeah. and it's just a shame because look, I had such a great time, and I really love those guys. But you know, after two years, it's been about two years or whatever it's been, maybe three. I don't, I honestly stopped counting. I, I don't know, but you know, I've kind of just arrived at this like thing. Like, I, they're fucking assholes. You know, I mean, I love them, but it, I don't. There's just no good reason. There's no good reason why they couldn't have said anything 
about what we had done together or right. not even, you know, why wouldn't they publicly just say, hey, we thanks, thank you, Chris, yeah. you know? We did, we did some really kick-ass music, and we're proud of it. And for the fans, so here it is. It's going to always be there. You should check it out. It's great. Maybe one of these days we'll do a couple songs with him or, or fuck, whatever. Yeah, I don't yeah. care about that. But it's just you can't erase your past. No, because well, it's embarrassing. And the fact that I was, I've was i been nervous about even talking to you about it makes me mad. Because mm-hmm. now, like, what, why would I have to be feel bad about how I share, you know, I'm human. It hurt. It yeah, fucking yeah. hurt. Uh, I don't want to be in live anymore. That's certainly not the case. Um, I'm happy for them. I'm glad they're back with their boy. That's fine. And as a matter of fact, I don't, you know, Ed and I used to be pretty good friends for a little while there, way before we were. You right. know, I knew Ed better than I knew the rest of the band, which is kind of strange. Yeah, that's and strange. you know, I have, I have no ill will towards Ed or the band at all. It's yeah. it's just it's embarrassing to me that because you know. You were erased from yeah. their from from their side of the fence. Well, yeah, and and even and even that I've, I, I've it's been a hard pill to swallow. But what really hurts and sucks is that I can't think of all the fun and awesome things we did without getting fucking mad. Right. Because as soon as I think about oh you know I like Australia or any of the good things or any of the big shows you know you, you're bringing up it's like uh, I'll go yeah and then I'll go fuck yeah well it's funny fuck they, those guys because in my head I saw all I saw all I'll say is I'll remember something I'll go ah oh, no, fuck those guys right and that sucks I don't like that I don't enjoy that I don't I, I don't like saying it you know yeah but it it's uh, you know I would never do that to anybody I will never do that to anybody yeah it's completely disrespectful. And lame. It's just fucking lame. Yeah. So. Well, let's let's move off this subject on a positive note. Yeah. Which 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 I which sorry. Will, no, no, no. I, no, no, no. I, that's been sitting way down here no, for a long I, time. I'm, 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 I'm glad I could be of service. <laughs> but uh, again, in your farewell post, you said you know I was you were afraid to look at the comments or something to that end, mm-hmm. and you said you know your wife and someone else encouraged you to look at the comments, and I, I looked at the comments. Mm-hmm. Everyone was like. You know, this goes back to the fans. The fans, yeah. they totally loved you. Oh, yeah. No, I finally went back and I read every... And now I, I do read And even all on the turn, them. you know, the turn yeah. on YouTube, again, even even the guys are like, eh, yeah. he's okay, right. but, 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 but right. they're still, they still, you could still feel the respect they had. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, it wasn't an easy situation, but hey. Oh, yeah. No, no. And, and that's also what, what adds to the fire for me <laughs> is that it's just, you know, and, and look, the other thing, too, is that when we made the turn, the fans paid for it. We did pledge music. They, oh, they I put in, that. we raised a ton of money to make that record did for Jerry the fans. Did Jerry Harrison produce it? Jerry produced it. Okay. And that, you know, to, like, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. How, how do you have your fans pay for something that to make and then take it away from them? Take, no, take, no take it down. You know, um, it just, I'm embarrassed for them. It speaks volumes of, of, of a deep immaturity and utter lack, lack of respect. And uh, it, it, it's just, you know, I'm ashamed. It's, I hate that. I hate that I'm ashamed of it. You know, like, fuck, man. I work my ass off for those guys, you know, and, and put my heart and soul into it. I mean, I, I would have done, and I did anything they asked me to do. I was there to drop of the hat. I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have, I don't have kids. I, mm-hmm. I, I was able to kind of, I didn't have a job. Yeah. I could go and be wherever they needed me to be, you know? And th- this started to crack when I saw that, you know, I did have to, there was one show in particular I had to cancel because my family had an event and I told them months in advance and, and they got so mad Right. That, oh, Chris canceled a show that, you know, we could have made $10,000 on. And it's like, you guys cancel whenever the fuck you can't do anything. But suddenly I can't do one show and that I've told you about months in advance. And yeah. So that's that, that started to crack. Mm-hmm. And it's the same shit that happened with Unified Theory when I said, you know what, guys, I'm taking a break. I need two weeks. It's like, oh, so yeah. now he can just um, do what he wants. You know, it's like there's some sociopathic motherfuckers <laughs> that don't like that, that don't like someone else you know yeah well, it's, it's a deep power, it's, a power, it's, it's thing. a power play and it's 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 petty and it's just gross yeah. and i'm so glad to not be a part of it and you know i wish them well you know they did the same tour with counting crows that they did when i did with them in 1998 you know which they used to joke about that they would never do again right it's <laughs> just funny it's like so you're so now you're doing all these great wonderful big things that we would have done regardless 
Yeah, it doesn't so make sense. They, they got to learn a lot of you know never seen just just basic. Yeah, they're shit fine. They'll be live forever, and they'll do this. They'll do what they've been doing, and they'll you know they'll always have casino shows to play, make money, and, and they'll they'll have a career. They'll always have a career. It's great, yeah. and they should. And I and I wish them well. I mean, I love their families. I love them to death. I, they've got some of the most awesome kids. I mean, there's they all have like three kids each. It's a huge family of people. And some of the sweetest people you ever meet. Yeah, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, obviously none of this is personal because I yeah, yeah. love them. I made, I made so many great friends and, uh, you know, wouldn't trade that for the world. I just I just wish I could have my memories back. wish I could have the good memories back. And, and I'm getting there. I'm not bitter about not being in the band. I just, it's just a matter of respect for right. me. And I, I just feel completely, utterly disrespected. And that, that does not sit well with me. People can read into it or however they want. But um, I, I'm, I'm allowed to be hurt. Yeah, and, no, it, and sure. it hurts. It hurts. But yeah. having said all that, it's taken me two years now to get where I'm at. Yeah. At here, let's let's go there. How far are you into a new a new? Oh, it's I, pretty I, much. I'll, done. I'll call it an album. I don't know if we're, it's pretty much done. It's thirteen days, but, songs. Okay, it, it's like an hour running time. I'm just at the point now with it where I had a conversation with an old manager friend of mine last night about it because I'm banging my head against the walls because I've I've there's still a couple things I want to tweak, I, and I don't know when to let go of it. So I'm at that point. You need that a deadline. I need a deadline. <laughs> um, but also, I'm not sure, to, do I release them all at once? Do I release a song right. a week yeah. or a month? Do I do, like, I don't know the climate. Mm. I, I don't know what would do the songs more justice. Because nowadays, if you release 13 songs, who's going to listen to all 13? Yeah, yeah. They'll listen to the first three, you know? Yeah. They're not going to get to the, they, it might take them a year to go, oh, well, I wonder about that track eight. What's, what was that on shuffle all of a sudden? You know? Right. Maybe it's better to just release each song. And I'd like to do a video for each one, which I could shoot, you know, on my phone or mm-hmm. whatever, or use use killer. Uh, I've got a ton of stock, cool stock footage and stuff that I could add cuts of other things in. Do you sense a underlying theme to the 13 songs? Yeah, it's it's cathartic. It's it's a, I mean, the whole experience has been incredible because I, I have literally become a machine. I mean, I, I, I have, uh, Learned to play drums pretty pretty damn well, um, well enough for me mm-hmm. to play my my songs. It's like like I can play all these instruments, not anything you would know, <laughs> but I can play the parts I need to play for my songs. Like if I if I hear a part, I'll figure it out. It might be hard. I might have to tape things on the keys to remind myself where I'm going, but right. but I'll, I'll get that done. And and I can edit the drums in a way that you know if I you know right. I, I I can piece it all together so that I can get the performance and make it the band that I would like to have, you know. On top of that, the learning to edit and, and everything came came to me pretty quickly because, you know, I have had the advantage of working with some incredible engineers and producers, and I've sat, you know, behind the shoulders of giants, you know, yep. and, and I've watched. And one thing I have learned, and I learned many years ago, is to keep your mouth shut. And if you just watch, you'll you'll learn. Things will rub off. Mm-hmm. So... I started to know, well, you know, opening up these plugins and things that I was very familiar with. I've seen them all a million times. I just never actually had the chance to do it myself. Um, it's been a really awesome experience. I've learned a lot about myself in the process. Not 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 just cool making cool songs, but yeah, yeah. you know, um, such as. Well, I I got a great story because um, I have. I bought this little DW drum kit, like a little, little practice kit. It sounds great. And actually, most of the drums on record is, for, is that drum kit. Um, but I wanted to get a badass snare, and, and I'd done some research. I found this really killer cedar snare that's like a $1,000 drum. Mm-hmm. And so I got it for Christmas, and I set it in the kit. Come to find out, the little crappy snare that I'd been using... I had done whatever I had done to it and taped and doctored and the, the things I put on it to make it sound sounds identical to the thousand dollar drum. <laughs> so what I learned is that I'm I'm able to get I know how to get the sounds I want. And clearly it's the tone is almost identical. Like you can't if you close your eyes you wouldn't know the difference. Mm-hmm. So I learned a valuable thousand dollar lesson. You know, that, that it it's what you do with the instruments. It doesn't have to be, you know, the dollar tags, none of that really matters. Right. And the other thing I learned too, same principle. I buy some new plug-in uh, that does, uh, you know, I put it on the bass, and all of a sudden this one plug-in does what I've been using four to achieve. So I get the same sound from this one. I'm like, okay, so I'm still arriving at the same sound. I know what sounds I want and how to get them. 
So it's 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 kind of cool yeah. to to realize that you know you know I could go to the paint store and buy pink, but actually what I've been doing is using clay from the backyard and some baking powder and this and that. And I'm yeah. getting the same color, but it's just a different way around it. Now and that's you, something fulfilling about that. It makes you feel like okay, I'm on like I'm on the right path. I'm I'm clearly doing something right. You know, yeah. It's just a good. The, the, those are good signs. It makes me feel good. It's like it's like a inner win. I don't know. How long has it been since the studio got? Um, you know, I've had it up for about for a little over a year, something okay. like that. Because so, because so, I did the record with Hope and them, yeah. uh, it, that was my learning my way around right. all, all of it. Because I knew that if I jumped into my record, that I, I would end up getting frustrated and then probably not finishing the songs because. I would make mistakes and and and, 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 and like abandon it. So right. I know myself too well. I'm glad I did what I did because it was one. It was a hell of a lot of fun, but I put so many hours of work into that record. I mean, I really did. And you know, I would in hindsight, I would have done so many things different. But that was the whole point of it. You know, was <laughs> sure. to, was to learn. Uh, but but I think we got a, we got a fun record out of it, and and they had a blast. And uh, I I, I want to record them again. Uh, and and just see how much better we can actually make it. Yeah, just for clarity for anybody listening, that's Hope Nichols, who right. I had on the show mm-hmm. a little yeah, while yeah. ago. Um, do you have the bug to produce? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'd, I, mean, I'd, I think I'd be a really great producer. Not 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 just from not not saying that my taste is better anymore. That's that's all subjective. But but in the in the sense that I think that I know how to get a good a good performance out of people because I don't I'm not I'm not very patient with with a lot of the, the garbage. Like, mm-hmm. I think I'm, I know when to tell people to shut up or put your guitar down or, you know, just play the damn part. And then right. let's, let's, you know, cause there's just people just second guess themselves constantly. And I've, I've had a career of sitting around with bands doing that. And it just drives me nuts, yeah. drives me nuts. So it, it's, it's, it's fun to, to whoop, to whoop them into shape and get, I, I, I like doing that and actually working with Jerry Harrison. He, he was like that. And uh, it makes me laugh a lot, actually. It, Wonderfully difficult. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's that was your quote, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's um, exactly. Is the word out that you're, uh, you know, any produ- producer for hire? Um, I've only told a couple people, but uh, not necessarily, because uh, I'm mainly I'm not ready to do anything yet. I mean, because I, I need to finish my my record, and mm-hmm. so that's kind of on the back burner. Okay. Um, all right, we're down to the last five. I have okay. five questions that okay. everybody gets. <laughs> the f- first question you might relate to, it's, you know, hypothetically, if your house was burning down, mm. what would you run in and retrieve that's, you know, a, a music-related artifact that you could not do without? Having been through a house that burned down, I, I wouldn't go back in the house. There's nothing that I have attached value to in that respect. I, and ha- that's only something I've learned from the fire. I mean, I've got guitars that I love, but I don't... Everything's replaceable. Right. The only thing I, only, sentimental value? The only thing I would grab would be something alive, you know, like an animal or my wife. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's a given. That's, yeah, that's, that's a, a given. That's a given there. I, I really don't... I mean, I would grab a hard drive. <laughs> okay. That's what I would grab, because that's my entire record is on it. But, you know, what's funny is... and. Um, I got a couple backup drives and I sleep with the hard drive. I literally, it's, I take every night, it sits next to my bed. I'm so afraid of, you know, I can't, I'm afraid if anything happens, that record's gone. Like, yeah. you know, even though I think it's in the cloud, I just don't know. Yeah, I just the, don't, the, the you know. fucking cloud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question two is that if I was at liberty to give you a million dollars for one charity, which charity would you donate it to? I mean, it would probably be some form of cancer research. Okay. I mean, I, I, I mean that's what's touched me the most mm-hmm. uh, in my life. Pro- probably something along those those lines. Okay. That's yeah. Fair enough. That touches touches mm-hmm. all of us. Mm-hmm. Question three is: What would your walk up music be to the Pearly Gates? Oh my God! You know what song just popped in my head? <laughs> Never gonna give you up. Never- <laughs> I don't know where. <laughs> Rick, I, you know, I think yeah, uh, that's so funny. I don't know. That's just I my think, sense of humor. I think I, the higher power would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, I. Um, now it's going to be that. You know, <laughs> that's. Full. I don't know. I really don't know. That's acceptable. It would be some sort of a drone. It'd be a really pretty drone, um, and you know, something just like ohm, right. something like that. Okay. I dig that kind. Of, I love stuff like that. 
like an ambient uh, yeah, yeah. Brian Eno? Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Okay. Opposite of that, what's stuck on repeat in hell? Maybe lightning crashes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> last last question is, uh, it's typically what's the best concert you've witnessed, but sometimes I throw in, what's a live performance you've witnessed? So, for example, I had a writer on here once who was backstage at a Mud Crunch show and got to see Petty and Roger McGuinn rehearse for the song they were going to play mm-hmm. for the encore. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a concert, but it was he was privy to that. Living in L.A. for like 18 years, I saw so many amazing shows uh, that you just really had to be there in the moment. And, you know, little club shows with mm-hmm. Jane's Diction or Rage Against the Machine or things that people would die to have been there to see with 20 people, you know, things like that. But but um, as far as like most mind-blowing, I think life-changing, was maybe seeing Jane's Addiction in 90. One, whatever the year the Lollapalooza, the first Lollapalooza, I okay. think it was, was it 91? Yeah, I think that's about right. Because that's right when I was ready, to, you know, my musical career was starting in my mind. And, and when uh, that curtain opened up and they started like two hours late, you know, I, my brain, my mind, my heart, everything just, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I didn't know that it could be church. It could be something completely you know, right. unique, to un- transcend, transcend the, the whole experience into something that was, you know, and you had to really be there to understand. I mean, the time when it, when it happened in my age, the whole, all of it was just a perfect combination of wow. But yeah, I think that was, that was a turning point for me. Cause I, I didn't know it could be, I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And that's, that's how I want to do it. And, then, and, that, and that's what you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because years later I ended up playing that same stage. And I had a moment of like chills. Like, wow, this is amazing. I'm Have playing. you met the guys and been able to say, God, I saw you back when No, I never. I've, I've met Perry a couple times, but it was always. And actually at my house, which is kind of strange enough. He was there for my roommate's birthday one time. And um, I was too overwhelmed yeah. that I turned around in my kitchen. He's like, hey, man, do you have a wine bottle open? And I was like... <laughs> And I looked over at my buddy. My buddy's like, "That's fucking Barry Carroll." <laughs> He's like, yes, yes, "You know, I was too, I was, yeah, I was too starstruck." And, um, <laughs> that was a good impression. But though. no, I've never, I've never, never really, uh, you know. And I met, I'd see Dave all the time out. Uh, we we must have lived near each other or something. But no, never had a chance to tell him that. I will one day. Yeah, that's I cool. think I, yeah. Well, Chris, I was looking at my phone. I think I reached out to you. October of last year, so it's a <laughs> fucking pleasure to be sitting here and finally. Man, doing this. and I'm sorry it's no, taken no, this long. I, I I really uh, I haven't talked to anyone about this. Yeah, I and and it's it's uh, I I haven't needed to. I, I haven't wanted to. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's uh, I I have spent these years healing and you know sussing through some things and really just moving on in life and yeah. and you know committing to you know getting married and. Sure. And I've been trying to start a family, and there's all these other things, and you know, much, much bigger things happening, uh, and grander things in life than, yeah. than being in a rock band. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. You know, thanks for hey, the opportunity. Well, best, best of luck, yeah. career-wise, <laughs> personal-wise, spiritually, yeah. everything. Well, I appreciate it. Likewise. Right on, brother. All right. Huge thank you to singer Chris Shin for giving me so much of his time and opening up to me about his experience with live and so much more. After we spoke, he did share three new tracks, and they do not disappoint. They're really, really great stuff. I hope they see the light of day soon and get the attention they deserve. In the meantime, you can keep up with Chris on Facebook and Instagram and find his solo work as well as Unified Theory on Spotify and his album with live called The Turn on YouTube. All worth a listen. As for the podcast, please spread the word if you like what you hear. Go to Apple iTunes and subscribe, rate, and leave us a comment. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll be back next Tuesday with an all-new episode, so please join us again then. Episode 42, it was my white whale. It's been harpooned. Good night, Cleveland. Cleveland.